Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to this very special session in our series on the desert, which is part, um, of course, of our three-year exploration of natural landscapes and human meaning here at the Humanities Centre. Um, it really is uh, extraordinarily moving for all of us who have been involved in the Humanities Centre to have this session devoted to the work of the acclaimed artist Emma Stibben. Emma's work has graced the walls of our centre since we opened in 2016. And in 2019, she visited us to deliver a lecture, Landscape and the Innocent Eye, in which she explored the manner in which her work confronts extreme ecologies, icebergs, volcanoes, deserts, mountain peaks. So it's been a great joy for us, therefore, to have this exhibition, uh, Desert Sublime, exclusively dedicated to her work on the desert landscapes of the American Southwest. And we are accordingly delighted to have Emma with us via Zoom, of course, uh, from England, to discuss the works in this astonishing and profound exhibition. Uh, Emma will this evening be in conversation with Professor Derek Cartwright, who will also give a fuller introduction to her and to her work. Uh, Derek Cartwright oversees the exhibitions in the Humanities Centre in his role as Gallery Element Chair and has curated this Desert Sublime exhibition and produced its gorgeous uh, accompanying brochure. In addition to his work at USD, Dr. Cartwright is Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Timka Museum in Balboa Park, uh, educated at, at Berkeley, UCLA, and the University of Michigan. He has written on such varied artists as Robert, uh, as Robert Henry, Benjamin West, and uh, Fitzhenry Lane, and is Associate Professor in USD's Department of Art, Architecture, and Art History. You know, it really is one of the great delights of this job to work alongside uh, Derek, and I am very, very excited at the prospect of today's conversation. So please welcome Derek Cartwright and Emma Stibben. Yeah. Can you all hear me okay? How about you, Emma? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. So thanks, Brian. Thank you all for being here. I'm really delighted to be in conversation with an artist I truly admire. And so I'll tell you a little bit about her to begin with. Um, Emma Stibben was born in Munster, Germany, and today both lives and works in Bristol, UK. She received her training as an artist at Goldsmiths College in London and at the University of West England. Primarily known as a gifted printmaker, Stibben also makes large-scale drawings and installations. In 2010, she was awarded the Derrick Hill Scholarship at the British School in Rome, and in 2013, she was elected a Royal Academician at the prestigious R Royal Academy of Art in London. Five years ago, she received an honorary Doctor of Letters degree from the University of Bristol, where she has also taught, and a major monograph entitled Emma Stibben, Territories of Print, celebrated the first 25 years of her creative effort, and that appeared in 2020. Stibben's other recognitions are just far too numerous to tally completely here. I'm just going to mention that she has been the recipient of multiple fellowships and awards, including the residencies at the Scott Polar Institute in Cambridge, England, the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation in Connecticut, and the Stiftung Federikiel in Leipzig, Germany, as well as serving twice as a United States National Park artist in residence, both in Hawaii and in Death Valley. Stibben's work today can be found in the permanent collection of many leading museums, including, and I'm just going to again mention only a few, the Pallant House at Chichester, with, uh, the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, the Stadt Museum in Berlin, and the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. I should point out, too, that um, USD is fortunate to have its own solid representation of her print oeuvre, thanks principally to tremendous support from the Humanities Center and from uh, some generosity from the artist herself. So I want to thank them both for building this core strength in our collection. Uh, we now count 10 works by Stibben in the permanent collections here. 
In the same way she's been widely collected, her prints and drawings have been in um, hi, the subject of group and solo exhibitions throughout the globe, including recently in the exhibition Ruskin, Turner, and the Storm Cloud, and Fire and Ice, both of which took place in 2019. Uh, one, Brian mentioned this, but a small historical point, Emma spoke last at USD in conjunction with the exhibition Ruskin at 200, and at that time we also showed one of her prints. But this is Desert Sublime is a much fuller presentation of her practice, and it's the most ambitious project to collect together the work that she's been making in the American desert southwest uh, since about 2018. Is that right, Emma? I think so, yes. So it's, as I said at the beginning, a real privilege for me to be in a dialogue with an artist of Emma's rank and character and purpose in the world. Um, so please join me in welcoming her since it's very late there. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and can I just say, Derek, and, and to your um, to others who are listening, you know, it's such a joy to um, show my work with you. I'm, I'm really thrilled. Um, and it's great also that, uh, you know, your audience are also thinking about desert. Um, you know, I, I feel quite humbled, actually, since I'm, you know, English and not from America. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Well, we're delighted. And I think your perspective actually is an interesting inflection on the deserts in this region. So we're grateful. Um, we've only partly rehearsed this. I should tell you, this is a bit of an experiment and the distance makes it a little complicated, but Emma has some uh, slides that she wants to share with you. And so they're cued to some questions that I've already sort of presented her with, and there'll be some spontaneous exchange between us as well. And then we promise there'll be some time at the end for any of you who'd like to ask questions to pose them. Okay, so let's start. Um, Emma, as Brian said, the Humanity Center is concentrating its programming this semester on desert landscapes. And I'm wondering why you think this is a worthwhile subject for artists to consider. Wow, well, um, actually I'll start just with sharing my screen, um, just to show a few images whilst we're talking. Um, I, I mean, I guess the desert has been a trigger for sort of creative, ideas um now for uh, by the way can you see my image now upon yes yes and you too i think that's good um you know as, as a sort of physical space i think uh it obviously provokes awe and wonder um but also um i guess as this psychological experience you know when we're confronted with this expansive space it's so kind of overwhelming it conjures up ideas of the sublime um, and yeah, for centuries now, I guess, artists, visual artists, writers, filmmakers um, have been fascinated by that sense of the immense. Um, and I mean, my native geographical surroundings in the UK, you know, there's nothing like this. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that's what impressed me when I came out to the States, you know, to see that infinite horizon of the American Southwest um, was something that I, I just, it, you know, profoundly moved me. Um, and particularly, I mean, coming to this image um, of Mojave Desert Night, um, you know, the night sky in the desert, that unpolluted um, kind of depth, you know, you really get a sense of deep space when you look up into the desert sky um, and the, the kind of constellations of stars um, and, that sort of sense, it's, it's kind of simultaneously beautiful, but terrifying. Um, and in fact, you know, I, I think we were traveling by road at the time and these kind of big cactus, you know, were, they were kind of looming out of the darkness. And I, I did feel quite sort of uh, um, disturbed along with the kind of the beauty of it. It was sort of a, um, a really alien feel that um, I certainly haven't had in the UK. Uh, if I had to compare it to something, maybe seeing Antarctica, it was that sort of sense of immensity. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, that I know this is a well-trodden path. And, um, you know, as your question suggests, you know, artists have been drawn to this uh, for, for a long time. 
Yeah. Although it's interesting, I'm looking at this print and I'm also looking across the space at another one of your works, the aqueduct that we acquired and Brian mentioned was the first work to enter the collections here in the, and they both share this kind of Gothic spectral quality to them. And was that something you were aware of when you were out in the desert making an image like this one? Well, certainly this one, because it did feel quite Gothic, these kind of strange creatures almost coming out of the gloom. Um, I have a sense of, I think, gothic drama anyway, um, as you've probably picked up on um, referring to the woodcut, certainly my woodcut prints, which, um, you know, are, are much bigger. And as a, as a process, I think relief print is quite dark. And uh, yeah, I think I come from a, a kind of tradition of maybe uh, British art that, that takes their cues from the sort of dark or the um uh yeah the, I, I guess you know a lot of literature has that kind of gothic sense in British literature I'm, I'm going to move on to a a view of the installation which I haven't seen yet Derek I'm very uh thank you for sending through these installation views of the I show want to ask you, are you satisfied with my I am yes I'm 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 sort of uh um you know it's the first time that this group of work have been have been seen together. So uh, it feels for me a very kind of it's it's pleasing to see that sort of sense of an installation of things that I've sort of had in my head but never visually seen as a as a and also um, I guess that you've you've included some of my sketchbook drawings. Um, yeah, they're about five. Is, yeah, sorry. No, there are about five of the sketchbook drawings. We'll we'll talk a little bit about your practice, but as we were putting this show together, and I should really acknowledge my colleagues, Susie Smith and Sarah Bain, who are here, who are instrumental in, in making this show as impactful as I think it is, we wanted to talk about process in printmaking and give people a chance to see how you move from these field studies that you're making in the desert to a finished print, which may hang in a museum. And so it was uh, deliberate to pair them in this way and also suggest your practice, which I think goes beyond what you do in the desert. This is what you do when you go to Antarctica and places like that too, right? Well, I, I think it's important, obviously, that my um, my work does start out there in the landscape. And, you know, the sketchbook drawings are the things that I make in response to the, to the actual place. And um, I think, yeah, coming back to the show, that's kind of interesting for me to show the two alongside. I perhaps wouldn't normally do that, um, but I think it gives some insight into my kind of process of working. Um, and maybe also, um, you know, that sense of the, you, you can see the difference between my response obviously made in a kind of um, uh, intuitive way when I'm in front of the subject but back in the studio you know the prints obviously emerge from a quite a different type of process of working um, so so that's kind of interesting that you've included both um, but maybe also just to say about the show um, that it's being seen by your audience that obviously probably are familiar with these places and uh, I think actually Brian and the, the students have been out in uh, Death Valley in the last week, perhaps. Um, so I, I'm kind of slightly intrepid as well about, you know, who am I to come and actually represent your landscape? Um, you know, it feels um, interesting, but also a little bit nerve wracking that uh, I'm daring to represent something that's not my, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a, a landscape that I'm familiar with um, but but not obviously from. Can I, can I ask you something about that? Do you feel differently when you're depicting the landscape around your home in Bristol or in Sussex and that than you do when you're out doing this kind of field research or is your relationship to the landscape? Yeah. Yes, that's an interesting question because I um, it's only quite recently that I've I've actually looked at my familiar surroundings, you know, more locally. To home um I've, I've not really done that in my career up until now and uh you know mostly it's been projects that take me really far afield um to to often quite remote places so 
um, yeah, that's possibly, possibly I do have a different attachment if it's somewhere I'm really familiar with, but I also quite like the uh, surprise of, of, a, of a completely uh, new surrounding, you know, the challenges of that. Sometimes you kind of see it with a fresh kind of vision. Um, Perhaps, you know, I live at Bristol, you've visited Derrick, it's very beautiful, it's got a gorge, it's got quite interesting rock formations, which you think would be really um, artistically interesting, but I haven't actually represented them at all. <laughs> so. Well, could you talk a little bit about when you're making a sketch like the ones that are projected on the screen right now, first, how do you determine this vantage is going to be what you're after. And then also how much time will you spend? It's hot in the desert, right? So you're you're having to work relatively quickly. How long would these, they both look like they're two pages of a sketchbook put together. Um, how long would it take you to make something like these studies? Um, it's probably not more than an hour, maybe an hour, but uh, you know, I think these are a double A3 size, so, uh, you know, A3 sketchbook obviously opened. Um, but the, the kind of factors like, yeah, you've mentioned, you know, the, the weather, um, but also the light, if the sun moves around too much, because obviously it's quite uh, distinct, the light, when I've been working here, you know, as usual, it was sunny. Um, and so, you know, the shadow moves around and then you kind of have to, Take a different viewpoint in terms of the kind of you know angle of view i quite like it to try and kind of surprise the viewer like maybe i take an aerial view or, or i'm looking up at something i think that thing of cropping and framing the composition you know those sort of decisions around composition are, are really um what i'm interested in um and the camera really helps with that sometimes you know the, the way your viewfinder crops an image when you take a photograph, um, it kind of cuts things off. So uh, yeah, when I'm using my sketchbook, I'm quite often looking at things in a kind of, you know, with a similar eye. Uh -huh. What was it that intrigued you about the American deserts in the first place? Um, well, I think, I'll move on to another image. The, the, the kind of places like Dead Horse Point, you know, what a great, place name um you know that the kind of imagination of uh of, of the way it's been represented so say you know through films like john ford you know i'd be i was sort of brought up as most people of my generation were with westerns and uh you know whether that represents what happens in the desert or not obviously it usually ignores indigenous people but you know that the, those kind of the, the way those landscapes, the kind of panoramas of that uh, were, were really, uh, you know, compelling. And uh, obviously also literature, uh, I think I mentioned in our earlier interview about Zane Grey, um, you know, those kind of stereotypes of the pioneering West, um, it did really grip me. And I, I think that stayed in my kind of head as, oh, I really want to go and see these places. Um, and yeah, I mean, places like Canyon de Che, which is obviously in, um, in Navajo nation lands, you know, it's, it's amazing place and, and the preserved ruins there from indigenous tribes, you know, historically um, are fascinating. Uh, and yeah, it's just extremely beautiful. It's got that amazing red sandstone that kind of reflects the light. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I kind of went with this idea in my head of what it might be like, uh, thinking I'd be, you know, vastly off track. But actually, when I got there, it was was kind of quite familiar in a weird way. Um, but obviously, you know, that's a kind of superficial sense of the place, the actual place of actually living in some of the communities uh, around Death Valley. You know, life's really, really hard. It looks really tough. Um, and yeah, modern day life is pretty, pretty harsh. So, um, you know, it's I'm sort of cautious about representing things with a with a view of, um, you know, the sort of stereotype of 
the John Ford view. But having said that, you know, extraordinarily beautiful um, and difficult to not bring that with you to the to the place itself. So you weren't disappointed by what you saw when you got here? No, no. astonished. Um, and, you know, as, as of course, anyone, anyone, I'm sure it, your students that have been there recently must be blown away. Yeah, I think they were, right, Brian? Um, I think they're so lucky. Part of your practice is to conduct I'm just calling it field re research, you call it something else probably, where you're gathering information that you're going to take back to the studio and then ultimately create new work from it. But could you describe how this happened specifically in relationship to what you did when you were in the Southwest? Yes, I um, specifically with the, with the Southwest, I, I actually applied to do a, a National Park Art Foundation um, residency, which I was successful. It was really great because it gave me a month in Death Valley um, with accommodation at Stovepipe Wells which is near Mesquite um, Flat Dunes um, and yeah it was really great to have a base that I could actually uh, I'd obviously do a lot of hiking um, and uh, drawing in location so that was good to be able to I rarely get up early, but I did actually get up at dawn quite often because of the light, which would sort of hit the tips of the mountains and the dunes and slowly it would illuminate the valley floor. It was very, very extraordinary. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, my work always starts with being out there in the landscape. So um, for my field research, um, that's important to me that even if I might move things or adjust things as I talked about with composition in in my prints or my large drawings that I make back in my studio um, it's really important to me that that's rooted in the actual place itself that I have have brought back my research from the field so my sketchbook drawings um, usually many thousands of digital photographs, um, you know, that all gets distilled back in the studio into the works. Um, and I, I guess one of the reasons that the field research is, is also important to me is, is that I feel I, particularly in, in some of the landscapes that I go to where I'm seeing the effects of climate change, of climate warming, um, you know, that that's a sense of witness that I, I'm actually living through, as we all are, you know, this is an unprecedented period of change. So, um, you know, I feel there's an imperative to somehow record that. Um, and yeah, the field research is, is a really kind of, that's, it's kind of rooted in that really. Yeah. Um, most of your landscapes are unpopulated. They may have traces of human intervention, but they're they're not featuring figures. In fact, I think there's a little figure in your photograph here, but yeah, I guess yeah. you would just that. Um, from the print. Yeah, that's that, Emma. <laughs> that's true. I I think uh, part of the reason for for not populating the landscapes is uh, I want to sort of tip the viewer into the frame. So, so the narrative, if there is any, is one that's projected by the viewer into the into the space that they're that they're looking at. Um, I think as soon as I, if I introduced a figure or or something, you know, a kind of car or something, it sort of roots it then in a particular time and place, um, and you start to sort of imagine well, what's going on, uh, which I. I I kind of feel with my work, I want it to be a sort of um, a kind of sense of, of experiencing it for yourself, that you're in that place. Um, there's kind of physical, visceral thing of being in the place when I'm working and I want that to come across to the viewer. Um, so the viewer is not passive, they're kind of in it. Um, so for example, you know, salt flats, Badwater Basin, uh, obviously Death Valley, um, and you know that sort of incredible kind of crust of salt, the the 
those hexagonal shapes that I think uh, it's the repeat freeze thaw and evaporation cycles that, that that create that it's kind of a really harsh landscape but really eerily beautiful as well so um, I think I based this around a, an evening uh, that I was there where the light was just catching it it's kind of pink illuminated light I know it's not it's white landscape not dark but <laughs> I kind of wanted the drama of the shadow um but yeah I, I think unpeopled was was important I mean sometimes I might have I think my next slide really? which is the lotto guns ammo implicates people so um this was a sign actually um I was on a, a road trip um I think it is snowed and uh we needed to fill the car up and there was this sign um but I was astonished at the uh, when I went to pay and the, the guy behind the, the counter had got just literally all these different calibers of ammunition, um, bullets and stuff. Uh, and obviously lotto and ammo and beer and T-shirt. It sort of seemed like a menu of what you needed in the desert <laughs> to survive. Um, but unthinkable in the UK that you'd just go to buy your petrols and petrol and then get oh sorry gas in America um and then buy some bullets whilst you're there some ammo um but I I, I to be fair I did also exaggerate this a bit I think I separated the sign from the garage and I put the sign up on a hill looking a bit sort of severe and austere um and it probably wasn't quite as bleak as that but um that's my license as an artist I love it I also think just the idea that it's pointing sort of if we orient ourselves facing north, it's pointing west, right? This is the direction you go for all these things that you might need in the desert. Um, <laughs> it's fantastic. Do you have a, another image? The keen wonder mind, is that next? What have I got here? I mean, these also imply that there was a human presence here that's now vanished, right? And so a lot of the work that you've done around abandoned towns or abandoned mines sort of recalls a not too distant past in which these were thriving, economically prosperous places that that only leave us with these ruins. I think that's what struck me was, um, you know, I'd expected a, a big landscape, but gosh, you know, this human endeavor, the the kind of traces of, of, of some some you know really massive uh, like rhyolite um, or keen wonder mine which evidently was actually really profitable um, uh, you know I had to hike quite high into the hills I was there in January so it was quite the weather was quite benign and not not too hot um, but it was a real hike to get up to these wooden shoots which were part of the um, I think gold um, processing shoots um and yeah what that would have been like in the height of summer for for people that work there must have been really really um real hardship and yeah i i think the it's impressive that people were living these lives in in really extreme circumstances i guess with the promise of um you know it could it could go right but I would imagine more often than not you know it led to untimely endings and yeah I mean in America maybe that sort of pioneering sense of uh, endeavor and uh, you know grappling in the elements to to kind of make it work that kind of dream of, of, of making making a, a kind of fortune or um you know how how you're going to kind of set something up um the ambition of that is is impressive yeah uh, but, but looking at um i don't know if i've got some other ruination so these cabins in rhyolite which you know are quite modest um cabins i guess which workers would have lived in um and are still standing today um or they were when i was there it'd be interesting to hear if they've if perhaps you know decayed a bit more since I was there in 2018 um, or 19. Uh, I think, you know, it, it, when you look at a ruin, 
it it tells you about the past, about history, but it also it makes you think about the future. It makes you project forward with your own life and think, you know, your own endeavors and the things that you've invested in and kind of hoped for. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's a kind of a, um, metaphor for for perhaps thinking about existence and what we what we are as a species, what we're doing um, with our planet. Um, and yeah, I think it's a, a kind of um, quite a humbling thing to think about and to see, particularly with the rhyolite. I don't know if I've got more rhyolites. I've got Ballarat here. Um, I'm off on a, I'm off piece now, Derek. Just <laughs> going to look at Ballarat for a minute. Ballarat, I don't know if you visited Brian with the students, but that's another um, virtual ghost town now. Um, and I found this old historic photo of it online. Uh, lots of bars, um, evidently banks. Uh, they had no church in Ballarat. I think it was a bit of a wild place. And um, yeah, these days, um, I think it just has one residence still, uh, but mostly, you know, it's in ruins. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a, a kind of, again, poignant thing to see these buildings in a very extreme environment, very, uh, difficult to eke out an existence and yet there they were I mean I think four five four hundred five hundred people were living there in 1897 and then it lasted about four or five years and then it was you know the, the gold rush had moved on and things had crashed so um, you know you had to just kind of move on um, mm. It's it's kind of a, a I don't know if Ballarat I haven't got I'll come come on to Rhyolite I think we'd better mm -hmm. stop with my talking there. Well, when we were remembering when we were together in Bristol a couple of months ago, you mentioned that you would go into these places and there's still sometimes a few people who live there, and there we think of them as these sort of strange oddball types who would hang out in these abandoned towns. But you you mentioned that, you know, for them, you were the oddball, right? <laughs> that you were this artist showing up, drawing in the dust and, um, you know, sort of disrupting the quiet and peace of these places. I mean, what did you make of them when you when you had encounters? I, yeah, I think that's, um, it was kind of uh, interesting that I think, I think I, I was an oddity, uh, particularly my accent, and I know that sounds really uh, obvious, but uh, quite a few, I think uh, I would have been run off, run out of town a couple of times, but um, there were kind of one guy sort of, he, he more or less was about to call the sheriff and then he sort of said, oh, you're English, I'll show you around. Um, but yeah, I think when I'm sitting drawing, I, my next slide shows my kind of weird, you know, um, just I just sit down and do it, so of start drawing on the floor. Um, when I'm actually drawing, I think it's there's so much going on with with uh, you know if it's a bit windy or the weather, um, I'm, I'm so absorbed in it. I don't really think about what people think of me, um, and I've been doing it for a long time now. So I think that's you know probably um, just second nature to me. Um, but I think. Uh, the camera is so ubiquitous, you know, other tourists or people that are visiting probably think, well, why would you draw when you've got your camera? Um, and I must say, it's usually kids that come up and start saying to their parents, oh, she's drawing, like, I really want to start drawing. Um, and I feel frustrated that uh, that's not the go-to, you know, that we always turn to the camera. Um, because I think drawing, when you're in a place, it's not about making art necessarily it's about looking and um taking notice i think it slows down your sort of act of looking when you're trying to draw something um and you know it could be just a notation or or a um, you know as i say it's not about making a, a good piece of art i think it it's something that happens between your eye and your hand and your brain which definitely becomes quite indelible in your memory so uh, when I look back at my sketchbook drawings, I can really recall the place, um, what I was feeling, you know, the time of day. Um, whereas I have to say, I'm not a great photographer, perhaps you could say, but I, I don't get that sense. 
of the place when I look at the photographs. Um, you know, they have lots of information in them and I do use my photos for reference mm. for studio work, but I don't have the same recall as I do with the sketchbook drawings. So, um, so yeah, sorry, in, in answer to your question, I've no idea what people think of me, but I, it's a kind of obsessive activity that I, I just do without thinking now. I want to chase something you said a moment ago, and I want to think about the relationship between the field studies that you're making and how they get to a print, like the ones we have on the walls of this gallery next door. Could you talk about that process for a minute? Yes, that's, that's something that uh, I quite... So, for example, with this boom or bust, the sketch on the right, you can obviously see is my reference for the print on the left. Um, it's rare that something would be quite so um, transfer, you know, transferred across um, so directly. I usually might, well, I actually have enlarged the landscape on the left quite a lot and expanded on the, the kind of shattered um, wooden bits on the left of buildings. Um, but I think there are considerations about um, I want, I want to keep the sort of sketchiness of the drawing, that sort of looseness um, in the print. So um, the way that I make the drawing for the print is a similar way that I make my drawing on site. But with print, obviously you have, you know, it's a process. So you have to think about the um, staging of the image. Like for example, this one has a, a wood cut for the um, pinky horizon sky. And then it's a, a polymer intaglio overplate um, for the for the black, um, and you have to sort of make a separation for that and make sure that the two come together um, as a you know single image and that they register. Um, I think I've got a oh in this yes this is I'll I'll lead into showing you how I do that, but um, I just wanted to show the present day Cook Bank building and Rhyolite. So there's my little sketch on the left. And then Brian supplied the middle image, which I think came from your recent trip, Brian. Um, and then I found online the historic photograph of Cook Bank building. So you can see the front facade there um, and you know how massive that building was, which evidently was fitted out with mahogany and um, marble, certain, you know, counters. It was a really kind of, major building um, and like Ballarat um, it collapsed really quickly I think Bal uh, Rhyolite only lasted about three years and you know had thousands of residents um, anyway there's my print of Cook Bank building so you can see I've taken a lot of artistic license I just flicked back quickly I've changed a bit of the facade I've dramatized the lighting it's a kind of moonlit sky um, and a bit of the landscape behind it. So, um, so there's a bit of license in the way I transfer things across. Um, and I think my next set of images just show you quickly, um, you can see the separations. If you look at the top left hand image, um, I draw with Indian ink onto a transparent film um, and that's over a light box there. Um, and then below that, you can see me putting that onto a ultraviolet um, exposure unit. And the thing that I'm holding is a light sensitive printing plate, metal printing plate. And I put that over the um, Indian ink drawing and expose it through this UV process. And then that makes a plate uh, which I can print off. Um, and for the print, on the bottom right hand corner, which is called broken terrain, there's a pink plate and then there's a black plate. So you can see the pink plate above it. And then the final print below has got the black printed over the top. Um, so this process starts with the drawing, um, but as I say, it's on transparent sort of plastic film. So it's like a sort of positive that you then expose. Um, but I find that, going back to your question, um, taking the drawing into print, um, I try and keep the sense of the drawing, 
you know, the original drawing, but um, it, it obviously has to, to sort of be a much more conscious way of making the image into print. Um, but print is, I think, just really an extension of the drawing process. It's not something that I sort of see as separate. Um, and yeah, I, mean, I love the aspects of um, the fact it's a multiple, so you can then print, obviously, in addition. Um, and yeah, you can then sort of disseminate your your image to more places rather than just having a single drawing. Um, and of course, print has qualities of um, surface that drawing doesn't and vice versa. So um, yeah, I, I'm, I love print and yeah, it's, it's something that I'm eternally fascinated by. You tend to make relatively small editions for contemporary printmaker. You're not making hundreds and hundreds of impressions. You're usually working in editions of 20 or 30, it seems to me. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Yes. And I, I do my, I take the image into the plate and make the proofs. Uh, but then I do work with a master printer to do the editioning. So um, that at that stage, um, you know, once I've got my final print, um, working with a master printer, it's great because actually she has a much better facility at, you know, multiplying that exact image. I'm, I'm quite, it's a skill in itself and I'm not very good at that. Um, so yeah, it's, and also it takes a lot of time. And broken Terrain is based in this volcanic environment. And I think you did, work in the desert that also relates to that, particularly a work like Amboy Crater, right? Do you want to show that's, that? That's right. I think I've got that coming up. Here we go. Um, so again, I mean, I've, I'm looking at landscapes that are undergoing change and transformation. And obviously, volcanoes are the sort of ultimate transitioning landscape. Um, when I was in Mojave Desert, I, I did do a hike out to Amboy Crater. Um, and I was fascinated because the lava, um, the sort of lava bombs that get thrown out of a, um, this is a cinder cone that's, it is now um, uh, dormant, but uh, you could see all this volcanic debris around the cone that I guess had been thrown out with the um, eruption. Um, and it's kind of graded by size, which was fascinating as well. Um, and actually, like the previous image, Broken Terrain, I, I gathered up some of that volcanic ash in the landscape and then incorporated it into my drawing for the print. So it's actually got some of the um, earth, you know, the volcanic earth material ash from the site in the actual drawing. So uh, uh, that, again, gives it a kind of texture, a, a sort of gritty surface to it, um, but also quite like the metaphor of having, you know, the earth material that's representing the actual place in the, in the way that the image is made, um, sort of stands in for the place. This is such a great print. If you have a chance to go back and look at it and sort of study its, you know, almost photorealist description of rocks. And then as you move up towards the, I guess, the crater in the background, it becomes these just tiny little gestural marks onto the plate itself and yet still reads as this perfect recession. So really encourage you to look closely at this work. Emma, you just returned from Antarctica. That's one of the reasons you're not with us here besides your consciousness of your own carbon footprint in the world. But um, could you talk about that? And it's also a landscape that's undergoing tremendous change. Uh, yes, I'm, well, thank you. I, I have just got back from a recent, um, I actually got down to the Weddell Sea, which was exciting, um, which is uh, obviously where Shackleton got stuck in the ice. Um, and it's the part of Antarctica, the other side of the peninsula, which has these kind of tabular bergs, um, and it's really kind of ice choked. Um, obviously, you know, it's extraordinarily beautiful. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of, was drawing like crazy, trying to kind of capture all the different formations of ice that, that I witnessed. Um, but, you know, it is, it is around, particularly on the peninsula of Antarctica, um, rapidly changing and, and warming. Um, and it's been, you know, 
now um, measured for over quite a long period that the glaciers and ice sheets are uh, retreating. So um, it's it's sort of part of my um, lot ongoing project to look at uh, the retreat of glaciers and ice sheets across the planet. Um, and I think my preoccupation with that is partly, you know, it's incredibly beautiful and uh, the kind of wonder of that that those kind of extreme locations but obviously you know we, we're in this kind of period where things are really um disappearing and retreating um and being in Antarctica you know it's it's an enormous privilege and um I feel very fortunate that I'm able you know to witness that but I kind of want to somehow convey that in the drawings um, back in the studio you know the larger big drawings like this one of glacier tongue um, again I want to sort of suggest to the viewer you know a way to sort of almost enter the space of the image this is a big image it's probably I'm trying That's to remember in it's at about six foot I think one meter 85 width ways sometimes they're bigger might be sort of eight foot or nine foot wide um, you know, to sort of really give a uh, a sense of immersion for the viewer, hopefully. Um, you know, I I think I think for me, I I want to see if there's a contemporary role for the artist in, in recording these. You know, obviously pre photography, most expeditions in polar science would have taken an artist um, as a, a kind of person to record. Um, but uh, you know, for me, I sort of think, oh, is there still a kind of currency for, for that in terms of drawing, um, drawing right now? Yeah, I want to be true to what I promised this audience that there'll be a chance for you to ask questions. So I'm just going to ask one or two more of you, Emma, and then we'll turn it over to them. And the first is, are there historical artists? You mentioned the polar expedition attached artists, but are there historical artists who you think about when you're out in the field and or who impress you and make an impact on your work, contemporary or historical? Um, yeah, I, I, obviously, being a British artist, um, I, I kind of look to our deep, you know, our long tradition of, of landscape uh, representation and, and an obvious, I think I've got a, a John Ruskin here, which is a it's a very small, uh, you know, an intimate study of a piece of brick to show the cleavage in burnt clay. But I think what he really is longingly representing there is lichen and um, moths, you know, the way vegetation kind of hangs on there. And that, that kind of scrutiny of something I've always really admired in his work. Um, and as I say, you know, John Constable or, or Turner, or, or of course, the, you know, German romantic tradition of Caspar David Friedrich, you know, that those artists, um, I think, give that sense of the immensity of landscape and, and our tiny position in, you know, where, where as a species we kind of sit in that, um, which I find interesting. And maybe more, you know, coming to more contemporary artists, obviously, um, the uh, Selmans, who I, I think, um, you know, going back to Amboy Crater, I was really thinking about this, um, some of her desert images, you know, her, her kind of um, absolute love of each tiny particle and pebble on the, on the floor of the desert there, the way the light's sort of hitting it. Um, and other, another artist I admire, British artist Tanya Kovats, um, who makes these extraordinary um, sculptural um, casts. Oh, actually, I think they're mo they're modelled. They're not cast um, of rock formations and and other um, interpretations of landscape. Um, I think she's probably my last slide of that. Um, but other, you know, Anselm Kiefer would be a reference, perhaps uh, William Kentridge. Um, I think I could go on for quite a long time, Derek. So you better stop me on that. <laughs> question. I guess I want to give this audience a chance to ask any question you'd like of Emma and then we'll just tie this together. Shall I come back to you um stop sharing because that was my last yeah um, yeah now you're just it's all you mm -hmm. um anyone want to 
ask Emma a question? Brian. Can you hear Brian? I'll, I'll relay the question if you can't. Okay. Go ahead. Um, Emma, we both just come back uh, from Jeff Allen and speaking to a, a, a number of them and I think they took away the great stillness of that environment. And you, you write in, in uh, the infant brochure of your society and put to set the scene at a space outside of time. Really interesting with regard to your work. I'm interested in your thoughts on juxtaposition of the desert with the kind of bustling city life such as you have in Britain. Were you able to hear any of that, Emma? No. no. Let's try this a little differently and improvisationally. Brian, I'm going to let you ask that question again. <laughs> Hi, Emma. Hello. Uh, thank you for this. First of all, it's just wonderful to hear that. Um, what I was uh, saying, my question is, we just come back from the desert with students and none of whom have been to Death Valley before. So the, the landscape was very unfamiliar to them. And many of the students were struck by the stillness of that space. And I'm, I'm reading through the interview that you did with Derek in the, in the gorgeous brochure. And you speak there of your desire to set the scene at a space outside of time. So I'm interested in your thoughts on that juxtaposition between stillness, the stillness of the desert, and the strange freneticism of modern life, such as we find here in San Diego or even in even in your own town of Bristol. Um, could you talk a little bit about the sense of stillness and how that informs your art? Yeah, thank you. That's that's really interesting, and and that's also great that that you've managed to get out with the students to De death valley um i too was struck by the the silence and also it reminded me weirdly of of the the antarctic you know that sense of where snow and ice it's quite an insulated sound environment as well um obviously if you're in the boat it's kind of got a bit of ice kind of cracking and things alongside but it is something to do with the kind of being taken outside of a, a moment in time you're, you're kind of suspended somehow um and yeah I, I don't know so I, I mentioned earlier about the psychological impact of being in a space like that which I don't think can be underestimated it really stayed with me I think I went in 2000 and 18 um and then covid struck and we were all kind of stuck at home and it was i was just in that desert in my head <laughs> i think it was out of that period that i started making these images um and it was a sort of consolation in my head going back into the desert where i was draw making or drawing up with everything for the um for the prints um, and yeah, I think that really helped me through. You've only really made me think about that with your question, actually, um, because it, it it is something that doesn't leave you um, when you when you have that sense of a of a you know space that's really impressed you. I, I and and it, you're right, sensory. It's more than just visual. I I always. Uh, judge everything visually I suppose being a visual artist but um, I don't take account so much of other senses um, which is is really of course going on in in your in your body um, it's maybe I just don't have a way of recording that somehow so I don't take account of it but uh, I think it would be interesting to hear from you, Brian, because obviously you have um, a literary background as well and, and how that plays, whether you looked at literature and spoken word and sound whilst you were in the desert with the students. Do you want to respond? I could just get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to take up everybody's time, but one of the things that you'll, you'll appreciate, I think, is that what we what we did in the desert uh, when I was team teaching with a geologist 
and obviously that's not my background, but we were reading Burke's book on the sublime in the desert. And so that gave students a vocabulary for talking about that landscape in relation to those famous qualities of the sublimeness, the vastness, the silence, the, the roughness, and so on. And so we did try and approach this both from a literary slash philosophical perspective and also from earth science perspective. So you could see it from a number of different angles. We would have loved to have had you with us to introduce the, the artistic angle as well. So maybe next time. I didn't, um, I, Derek and I didn't touch on the fact that, that actually for me too, earth sciences is a really uh, important underpinning for my approach to landscape and quite often I'll um, meet with a, a an artist a, a, a scientist or an earth scientist to um, discuss uh, you know the features that I'm encountering or um, the kind of how, how a landscape is actually formed I you know that the sort of deep time geological time fascinates me Ron yeah um, thank you very much Excuse me, I, I wonder if I could um, ask you to maybe comment a little bit as a visual artist on the color palette that you work with in a desert environment and in somewhat in parallel in the Antarctic or the Arctic, in the sense that it's always been my impression that when you eliminate certain colors from the palette, like for example, you eliminate reds and yellows and oranges, you then get a chance to expand greatly the detail within which you can explore browns and grays, shadows, light uh, in the Antarctic blues. There are, I don't know how many shades of blue in the Antarctic. And so as a visual artist, I wonder if you comment a little bit on how you explore color palettes when certain elements of the palette are effectively removed and others allow for so much more variation within which what otherwise might be considered a very narrow spectrum. Yes, that's really that's really true. And I, I mean, first and foremost, I'm not. I don't think I am a colorist, so um, I'm aware of that. And I, I even wonder sometimes if I choose, you know, projects or places I'm going to represent because they like Iceland's a gift for me because it's a very um, monochrome kind of black and white terrain, um, and uh, uh, obviously uh, the polar landscape is some it's very delicate um it's not it's not like a kind of australian you know bright uh, deep colors um but coming to death valley was quite a challenge in in places you know it's beautiful like i think they call it artist palette that area of geological kind of um amazing kind of uh variety of rocks and um uh i i probably avoided those places because <laughs> I was really thinking wow what am I going to do you know that for me it's a, a kind of graphic um interpretation perhaps um of place sometimes atmospheric as well um and yeah for, for me probably choosing the time of day is part of that decision making as well for example in kind of twilight where it's exaggerating the the tonal um sh shadow you know got long shadows um and you know the the kind of silhouettes and contours of things become really apparent uh as opposed to you know midday sun where you've really got a kind of full-on uh light on the landscape uh which i find a real challenge to represent uh using the media that i use um, I did have to get some permissions, but I managed to collect some uh, some of the earth materials, uh, which were extraordinary. When I, you know, I only got some small piles of things, but the the colours range is extraordinary. There, you know, you've got real greens of rock when you grind it up, um, reds. Uh, yeah, it is literally an artist's palette. So yeah, I did. I I feel. Uh, I didn't make the most of the colour there. Um, you know, if anything, a kind of uh, monochrome, I'm, I'm in my element. Another question? Yep. 
do you know the theme of your piece before you um make it like right when you arrive at the scene or do you just know that it's a powerful image and uh you decide later after the sketches and so on yeah that's a good question i i've often wondered about this because i, I mentioned earlier about you know there's kind of received images that you have say from me seeing a john ford film of um, monument valley say and you're kind of thinking, oh, you know, there it is, there's Monument Valley. And it's kind of like fulfilling what you, oh, goodness. I'm, can you still hear me, Derek? Yes, sorry. <laughs> Maybe our, our Zoom link ran out, Derek. C can you still hear me all right? I can hear you, can you hear us? I can, yes, yes. Um, so going back to your question, uh, I, I do sometimes wonder, am I, am I, is it like a self-fulfilling, you know, I've sought out this place because I have this image I want to project onto, onto it. Um, but no, I think more often than not, when you actually arrive somewhere and then you start to um, make a drawing and, and sort of orientate yourself walking and and exploring um you, you discover you know it's not at all what you thought it was going to be um and yeah that that's the joy as well of being in a place for a you know a decent amount of time which i was lucky that i had a whole month um to to be in death valley so i could see it at different times of day um different lights different weathers it even snowed while i was there which was extraordinary So I, but I yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say because it is a really interesting question because I think a lot of artists, probably and writers, have a, a a kind of projection of what they want, and then they seek out their subject to fit their. Um, I, I pretend to myself that I'm a kind of a recorder, and I'm out there you know, making a faithful representation of what I see, but I know that's not the truth. You know, I definitely have, you know, come up with a fiction at the end of it. It's rooted in the place, but the final print or image is something that is, um, you know, a, a, yeah, it's a, a response to that. Emma, could you tell us what you're working on right now? Um, yes, I'm struggling a bit at the moment. I'm trying to, to I've got a big uh, museum show in a, in a venue in, in England, which is right on the coast. Um, and it's a chalk uh, coastline, a bit like Dover, you know, the White Cliffs of Dover, like a big, uh, very uh, high, it's called Beachy Head is the famous part of the beach of the cliff face. Uh, and it's uh, quite rapidly um, now with the sort of weather, um, extreme weather events, uh, lumps fall off into the sea. Um, and so it's quite dangerous to, to walk underneath. And I'm just trying to do a large wall drawing of it, uh, 25 feet long by about, I think it's um, five meters high. So that's about five degrees there. 15 feet high by 25 feet long. And so that's gonna be the wall drawing of a cliff. And then I'm working with a fabricator and we're trying to devise how to make a rock fall in three dimensions that projects into the gallery space. So it will be like a drawing with a bit of a kind of 3D rock fall coming out. And when's that gonna be shown? <laughs> Luckily it's a whole year away. <laughs> I think it might take a year to make. I've realized now how much work it's going to be to make all those rocks, but <laughs> I'm using some of the actual material from the landscape um, in the drawing and obviously in the fabrication of the, you know, some of the rocks, but some of the larger pieces we're going to have to make, some of the larger boulders. Well, good luck with it. It's it's Always. really out there, and want to thank you for all of your time and for this great work that's here in San Diego. Let's have a round of applause for Emma. Thank you so much, Derek, and thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, and uh, yeah, get out into the desert. I say, definitely. Mm -hmm.